So today I'm I'm very happy to be welcoming Marianne de la Lasanti here as our welcome speaker. Uh, she's a professor of physics at Princeton University. Let me tell you a little bit uh, uh, about her, her background and, and her interests. So uh, Marangela uh, did her bachelor's at, at Harvard University, where I have to note that she was uh, elected one of the world's top innovators under the age of 35 by the MIT Technology Review, and she was under 20. Okay. <laughs> but I'm embarrassing you, but the majority has an exponential trajectory that's continuing on throughout her whole career. She went to Stanford to finish her PhD, uh, he then uh, uh, joined uh, the Princeton Center for Theoretical Science as a Simon's uh, postdoctoral fellow. Uh, they, they realized what they had in hand and they soon hired her as a professor in 2013, where she's been uh, ever since. She's uh, uh, been awarded uh, many, many uh, uh, awards, including the Sloan Research Fellowship, Cottrell Scholar Award, the President's Award for Distinguished Teaching at Princeton University, and the Simon's Investigator Award. Um, in terms of uh, the substance of what she thinks about, she's an expert, uh, one of the world's experts on the theories of dark matter and their experimental consequences. Uh, as many of you know, and as I'm sure we'll hear about, uh, dark matter is uh, the stuff that makes up most of the universe. It's something which is still mysterious because we've seen it gravitationally, but otherwise do not know what its uh, inherent properties are. And Mary Angela has been at, at kind of the forefront of disentangling that. She's at a kind of uh, 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 I would think of her as kind of a dual class person since she understands deeply the theory behind the models and at the same time understands deeply the experiments which connect those models to data and her, 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 her work has reflected that. She's done a lot of the uh, important work understanding constraints on some of the most um, well-motivated models of dark matter including weakly interacting massive particles and axions, uh, but she's also had a kind of more model independent story of studying dark matter in any context possible, from the biggest possible experiments that the universe provides us all the way down to, say, ground-based experiments. She's done important work in direct detection, cosmic ray of uh, constraints on dark matter, even collider physics bound on dark matter. And more recently, she's been interested in how dark matter affects the dynamics of uh, galaxies and stars, which I think she'll tell us a bit about today, using all kinds of cool uh, new, new tricks and simulation, machine learning, and so on. Uh, so with that said, let me uh, welcome uh, Mary Angela Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Cliff. And uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be back here at Caltech. It has been a few years since I've been out for a visit, and it's been really wonderful to see, uh, see everybody again. Um, so as Cliff said, I'm going to talk a bit about some uh, recent work that uh, my group has been doing, we've been thinking a lot about ways in which varying the properties of the dark matter particle, um, how we can impact galaxies, so both the Milky Way um, and also other galaxies beyond the Milky Way. And I'm starting here actually with uh, the image here is taken from the Gaia satellite. Um, so Gaia is measuring the phase-based distribution for um, billion stars in the Milky Way, which is an unprecedented amount of information about those stars. And we've been learning a tremendous amount about the structure of our galaxy from the Gaia data. And you can see here in this image, either um, you have the, the sort of white horizontal galactic disk there. And then those little specks that are highlighted in boxes are the dwarf galaxies that uh, orbit the Milky Way, some of them, not all of them. And so that's how they actually show up in the data. And we'll be talking a lot more about those dwarf galaxies and others over the course of the, the talk today. Um, so dark matter uh, remains one of the biggest mysteries in physics. We know it comprises the vast majority of matter that's out there, like 85% of everything that's there. And so the big question is, what is it? Um, especially from a particle physics perspective, what's the model that we want to write down to be able to explain it? Um, to date, the sort of reigning paradigm for dark matter is the cold dark matter hypothesis, where we assume that the dark matter is cold and collisionless. Um, the CDM or cold dark matter paradigm has been uh, uh, verified and confirmed on the largest scales of the universe. So specifically with data from uh, cosmic microwave background, so shown here on the right, uh, is data from the Planck satellite. Those are the red points. And then the green line is the theory prediction assuming a Lambda CDM model. So it's uh, just stunning how the theory just tracks those data points 
um, even given the really, really small error bars that you have to squint to see on the, on the data there. Um, and then also looking at large scale structures. So here on the right uh, is data that's mapping uh, galaxies across very large scales. And the blue uh, in the two panels there, uh, that's actual data. Um, so you can see the sort of web-like structure that uh, the galaxies form when you're mapping them out on these scales. And then the red is showing um, a mock-up of uh, based off of simulation of a lambda cold dark matter uh, uh, scenario. And you can see, again, you, we're reproducing that beautiful web-like structure. Now, uh, as in any hypothesis, when you set it out, you want to make sure that it holds on all scales. So uh, as the previous slide showed, you know, we've been, you know, CDM has really done a great job on the largest scales. And so the next step is to verify that it holds up as we push the smaller and smaller scales. So in particular, where we really want to stress test it is looking now at galactic scales. So that's really kind of the next frontier, um, understanding whether or not we can explain the behavior of galaxies in the cold dark matter framework um, and or whether or not we need to change up that framework in order to be consistent with the data. This is a particularly opportune time to be tackling this question, um, pretty much because of advancements that are occurring on three separate fronts. So on the particle physics side, there's been a remarkable uh, flourishing of ideas for what the dark matter can be. Um, just over the last 10 years or so, the way in which we've been thinking about dark matter has changed a lot. Um, and you know, when I sort of started in graduate school, it was, you know, dark matter is a weakly interacting massive particle with a mass that's 100 GeV, like it was very fixed. And now we have a much more sort of broader understanding of what's viable and what's not viable. And it covers a much larger range of uh, mass space and also interaction space. Um, on the uh, simulation side, uh, there's been rapid advancement in our ability to actually simulate and model uh, galaxies. Uh, and that's uh, a tremendous boon because now we can sort of fold into that the different dark matter physics models to understand what the implications are on those scales. And then the third branch of this is the wealth of data that we have and is going to continue coming online. So I've already showed you data from Gaia, but uh, we also have data from DES, uh, Dark Energy Survey, um, Ruben Analysis T, uh, Roman, Euclid, there's just a whole array of these uh, observatories that are either running now or going to be running in the next decade. And we're just going to literally be flooded with data. So um, the goal here is to try to merge these three areas together to really kind of understand exactly how we go from a particle physics Lagrangian, which would be at the top level down to a prediction to the data where we can really make robust and concrete uh, statements about whether or not uh, you know, that particle physics scenario is viable or not. So for the purposes of this talk, I thought I'd start by just kind of reviewing the situation in cold dark matter. So we'll talk about how galaxies, like how we think of galaxy formation in the cold dark matter scenario, and also talk about the uncertainties that still exist in the modeling for that case. So that kind of gives us a, a, um, a sense of where we stand in terms of just CDM alone. And then for the rest of the talk, we'll delve a bit more into what happens when we start changing the dark matter physics and what that does to the, uh, the structures of, of galaxies. So in the, in the standard picture, uh, we, the universe begins with um, perturbations, uh, matter density fluctuations. And in the regions where those fluctuations are largest, um, you have uh, sort of dense regions where the dark matter will start coalescing to form um, small halos, which we think of as sort of sort of puffy spherical uh, regions of dark matter indicated by the blue um, in that right corner labeled birth. Um, and because baryons, so the gas and the stars are gonna get pulled in by deep gravitational potentials, they will preferentially be pulled into the centers of these dark matter halos. So these halos are essentially seeding the growth of the galaxies in their center. 
Um, and then as time progresses, so that's moving to the right, um, you are going to start getting star formation in these systems. The galaxies themselves will start growing by merging with other galaxies that are nearby. Um, and that just sort of continues evolving until you see galaxies such as ours, which is indicated in the top diagram there, which is sort of a full-fledged galaxy uh, with some rotating spiral disk in its center. And changing the physics of the dark matter will sort of end up having impacts at a variety of stages in this evolution. So if we were to kind of look in more detail at one of these dark matter halos as it's forming, this is what it would look like on the right if you were wearing your dark matter goggles and that was the only thing you could see. And then on the left, if you're just using your regular eyes, as we all do, and you just see the visible stuff. So with your dark matter goggles on, you see you know, the halo, which is the main halo, which is kind of big and um, essentially spherical, not exactly, but roughly. Um, and then there's a tremendous amount of structure inside of it. So the white regions there are gonna be the regions of higher density. So the highest density region is in the center of that halo, but then you also see these kind of spots all around, and those are gonna be smaller little subhalos that are caught by the gravitational um, attraction of the big main host, and they're just kind of orbiting around. The largest of those subhalos will have stars and gas in them, and so those will be the ones that we can actually observe and that we would see as like dwarf galaxies. Um, and the smaller ones will actually just remain completely dark. So there'll be these sort of very dense, dark subhalos that are still orbiting around, even though we can't observe them. The right is the version of what we see with our own human eyes. Um, so when we look at the Milky Way galaxy, we see its disk in the center. Um, and this is kind of roughly to scale. So you can see how small that disk is compared to the actual size of the full dark matter that's surrounding our galaxy. And then labeled on there are a bunch of the little dwarf galaxies um, that we've identified in the Milky Way. So those are gonna be the ones that form in the largest subhalos. Uh, what you don't see on the right are all the other little subhalos that don't have any stars and gas in them that continue to remain um, completely dark to us. So the amount of data that's been accumulating on this has sort of been very rapidly accelerating. Um, and Gaia, which um, I showed you the image from on the opening slide, has been one of the big drivers of this. Um, I'm going to play a little movie that actually shows the um, uh, sort of zooms in and actually shows all of the dwarf galaxies, globular clusters, and stellar streams that Gaia has identified. The stellar streams are coherent streams of stars that are either formed as a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy is being disrupted as it falls into, um, into the Milky Way. Uh, and so each of these different little colored like stream-like things um, is one of these streams. And so you can see that there's a whole bunch that have been found. And every so often there's a sort of like box that whips by there and that's one of the dwarf galaxies. Um, and down here is just showing a timeline of some of the upcoming observatories coming online. Uh, Rubin Analysis T is the next big one, and that one's particularly exciting because it's going to extend our ability to map out these streams and dwarf galaxies to much larger radii in the Milky Way. So Gaia is essentially focused a bit more on the central regions, and Rubin Analysis T is going to allow us to continue making maps like this, but going out a lot further to the edges of the Milky Way's halo. So to a lot more fainter systems. Um, a simple way of kind of tabulating all this is literally just to count the number of these halos that you see of a given mass. Um, so that's shown here as an example. So the vertical axis is literally just a count. And then the X axis is a mass of the halo. And to kind of orient you, um, a Milky Way mass halo is roughly 10 to the 12 times the mass of the sun. Um, so this is the, the, what you'd expect for these halos in a Milky Way type system. The red stars, they are actually indicating the dwarf galaxies that have been discovered in the Milky Way. So you kind of get a sense for their counts. Um, in cold dark matter, the prediction is that the number of these subhalos will just continue increasing 
as you go down to lower and lower masses, and that's indicated by the solid black line. Um, so that's a very concrete prediction of the cold dark matter theory, and it's one of the things that can motivates continuing to push down to lower and lower masses, because if we end up seeing a deviation from that, that would be a surefire test that the CDM prescription is not correct. Um, pushing down to lower masses means going to fainter dwarf systems. It also means probing these dark matter um, subhalos that don't have any gas or stars in them. So going down into that regime where uh, the subhalos themselves are completely dark. Uh, another important aspect of these halos that is relevant for understanding the dark matter properties is their uh, density profiles. So if you have a model in you just cold dark matter in your world, um, and you form one of these little halos, um, the density profile for the halos looks like a double power law, roughly, um, where up near the center of the halo, it goes as roughly one over R. Um, and these kinds of density distributions are referred to as cuspy, and I'll be using that terminology over the course of the talk today. Um, and what's interesting in these cases is that no matter what system you look at, maybe it's a ultra faint dwarf galaxy, maybe it's a brighter dwarf galaxy, maybe it's a milky, milky way um, system, in all of these, just in cold dark matter, you'd expect the density profile to look exactly the same and always have this one over R um, distribution near the center. Now, the world is not just cold dark matter. We know that there are stars and there's gas that is there. And this is actually really important because the presence of uh, baryons can redistribute the matter that, that exists um, the dark and the dark matter itself. So one of the really important um, contributors to this is uh, stellar feedback. So this is um, stars at the end of their life cycle um, will form supernova that explode. When you have these supernova explosions, they're going to inject energy and momentum, um, which redistribute the baryons as well as the dark matter. Um, and so modeling of this stellar feedback remains probably one of the most significant sources of uncertainty when simulating galaxies um, and can have a very large effect. So here's a um, just a picture showing um, in the, this is in a controlled simulation where there's only varying like one aspect of the supernova feedback at a time. Um, this is showing what uh, changes to the um, to the distribution of gas in, in the disk of a Milky Way-like system. And so you can see that for different uh, assumptions about the supernova feedback, you actually really do change the structure of the disk. Uh, in certain scenarios, the disk looks much more sort of choppy. You've actually blown out complete regions of that gas. And then in other regions, like in the top right, it's much smoother. So when you include this baryonic uh, feedback, into this picture and you you, um, you find that uh, when you inject energy from this feedback, you actually can blow out some of the dark matter from the inner regions of your halos. And what that does is it cores a halo. So in the same way that when you like core an apple, you remove the innermost region. Um, in this case, the energy that's introduced ends up removing some of the dark matter from that innermost region. It sort of flattens out that density profile. Um, so the effect that this has will actually vary depending on the size of the galaxy that you're looking at. So this is returning back to the plot I showed earlier where on the x-axis you have um, uh, going from ultra faint dwarfs all the way to more massive systems. And on the y-axis is the inner slope of that density profile. So as we said earlier in the scenario where you only have cold dark matter, um, no matter what system you're looking at, it's always going to go as one over R in that central region. When you introduce baryons, that's no longer the case. Um, that is shown in yellow. Um, and so what happens is down in the really faint dwarfs, so the ultra faint dwarfs here on the right, um, those are so faint, there's hardly any stars or gas in them. And so you actually don't really have that much, that much supernova exploding. And so the you don't end up coring the halo very much. As you move to more massive dwarfs, you have more of these supernova going off, blowing things out, creating the cores. And so you end up seeing that the yellow 
band moves up into that region where you're getting cores. And then as you move to a Milky Way mass halo, you go back down, you're no longer forming cores anymore because that's in that case, you have such a deep gravitational wall from the amount of dark matter that's there because the system is so large that even if you have all of these supernova that are exploding, they're not efficient in terms of creating the cores anymore. Um, but what this does tell you is that there's sort of this sweet spot where you do expect to have galaxies with cores that are forming when you include baryons in this um, in this picture. And just to kind of give you a sense, most of the data that we have uh, on the sort of inner densities of these dwarfs is sort of peaked in this region here, mainly because going down to the fainter dwarfs is just really hard observationally. So that's obviously a very high priority, um, but currently most of our data is peaked right where the yellow band also happens to be peaked. Where does that data come from? Um, a lot of that data comes from rotation curves, which actually takes us back to some of the original, like some, the original data that convinced us that dark matter exists in the first place. Um, so this is kind of the work of Rubin and Ford in the 1970s and 1980s. So with rotation curve data, you're essentially looking at the rotational velocity of gas um, around the center of a galaxy. And um, in the, you know, if Newtonian gravity held, you'd expect that to follow the yellow line where um, it'll peak and then come back down. But what's actually observed and what was Rubin's sort of famous discovery, right, was that the rotation curves flatten out, which suggests that there's much more matter there than what we can actually see. So this data, uh, rotation curve data continues to be powerful to this day, um, especially in terms of characterizing the inner properties, the densities of smaller dwarf galaxies. Um, and uh, and continues to highlight challenges to our cold dark matter uh, hypothesis. Um, so in particular, uh, what I'm showing here is rotation curves from nearby dwarf galaxies. These aren't dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way. There are dwarf galaxies in the field, so outside the Milky Way. Um, all of the dwarf galaxies that are shown in this rotation curve all have approximately the same mass. So they're they're roughly the same size. Um, and you therefore expect them to all have very similar rotation curves. Um, but what you see here is there's a very large spread, in particular in how rapidly those rotation curves increase up to their asymptotic value. Um, that spread uh, is indicative of just how densely packed those dwarf galaxies are. The dark matter is in the dwarf galaxies. So if the dark matter is really densely packed in there and the density profile is cuspy, you'd ex the rotation curve shoots up really quickly and then plateaus. And then if the density profile is cored, the um, rotation curve uh, increases much more slowly. So this is actually a bit confusing. The fact that we have um, galaxies of the same mass scale that have such different properties in their dark matter density uh, properties. Um, and this is a, a sort of an active area of research and constant debate right now, trying to understand what the implications of this are. Um, the fact that we not only see cord galaxies and cuspy galaxies, that we see this sort of variation in systems that are of the same mass. Um, and when we compare to expectations of um, you know, CDM, including baryons, um, whether or not we can reproduce these kinds of behaviors, we haven't actually found a model that sort of works really well so far. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist yet, but it's sort of one of the challenges that are currently being, currently being faced. Um, so there are ways of being able to move forward by constraining um, the baryonic feedback contributions. There's a whole set of ways in which you can use observations to constrain the models that exist. Um, I was just gonna highlight very briefly one direction that my group has been following, which is to um, uh, semi-analytically model the orbits of dwarf galaxies in Milky Way type systems. Um, so in this kind of framework, you just analytically evolve the orbit of some dwarf galaxy, like using just a regular, uh, equation of motion for that galaxy, but you include physics in there in here that emulates some of the behavior of more 
uh, um, sophisticated cosmological simulations. The advantage of this approach is that it's really fast and really flexible, so you can very easily change the model that you're you're trying to test, and you can also create thousands of Milky Way galaxies at very little computational expense. So uh, my student, Dylan Folsom, and postdoc, former postdoc Orrin Sloan um, worked on uh, creating models of some of the Milky Way dwarfs um, using the semi-analytic approach. Um, so here's an example using Fornax, the Fornax dwarf. Um, and so, you know, Dylan generated something like thousands of Fornax-like dwarf galaxies and then looked at what their central densities looked like and their orbital pericenters. And he did this for several different feedback prescriptions. So the different feedback prescriptions are shown, one in blue, the other one in purple. And then observational bounds that are coming from Gaia and other observatories are shown in gray. So you can see that just taking data from um, that we have and are continuing to improve on for our dwarf galaxies, uh, and comparing to these theory expectations, we're finding that certain feedback prescriptions, like the one up here, are disfavored. Others seem to be doing a better job at um, reconstructing the data. And I think approaches like this moving forward are going to be very helpful for us to uh, constrain and continue improving upon our understanding of these um, baryonic effects on, uh, on galaxy formation. So, with that, um, backdrop of cold dark matter and galaxy formation in that context, I want to move on to talk about the impact that occurs when you start changing that dark matter uh, model itself. And there's two scenarios that I'm going to focus on. Um, both are cases where you introduce self-interactions in the dark matter. In one scenario, those self-interactions are elastic. The other case, they're inelastic, and you can actually pool your dark matter. <clears throat> so to put this sort of these models in context, I wanted to start by just kind of reminding you of sort of the classic cold dark matter example. So this is what's always thought up when you say cold dark matter. This is the particle physics incarnation of that, which is the weakly interacting massive particle. Um, so in this context, um, we assume we have the standard model. We extend it by adding one additional dark matter particle. We say that that particle is weakly interacting has GeV to TeV mass. And when we make those sets of assumptions, it actually gives us the correct abundance of the dark matter consistent with what we're measuring from um, CME uh, experiments. Um, this WIMP miracle, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, arises from um, assuming that the dark matter is in equilibrium in the early universe. But as the universe expands, it falls out of equilibrium. And at that point of time, that sets its abundance, which is the abundance of the dark matter that we observe today. Um, that abundance scales. So this is the abundance. It scales with the dark matter mass and its coupling um, in this way. Uh, and so from this, you can see that if you fix the mass and the coupling, so weak scale and on both sides, you'll end up recovering a relic abundance, roughly 0.1, which is consistent with Planck observations. Now, this isn't really that much of a miracle. Um, I think one of the really exciting things that's happened in the particle physics community over the last decade has been a recognition that um, WIMPs aren't actually that miraculous and that it's actually pretty simple to write down another model that can give you the correct dark matter abundance. Um, there's a ton of these that have now been written down. Um, I will just highlight one mainly because of its simplicity and it's really easy and simple to explain. Um, so in this example, what we have is dark matter and we supplement the theory with one additional new particle that we say is heavy. That's indicated by this gamma D here. And this dark matter chi can annihilate into the gamma D in the early universe. Um, the story follows very similarly to what I described on the previous slide. The end result is a dark matter density that scales in this way with the mass and coupling. But now you have this additional exponential here that also depends on the mass of your new state gamma D. So this ends up giving you additional flexibility. And you can see that you can, you can do things like change the mass and this coupling away from the weak scale and still end up getting the correct dark matter abundance, depending on the value of the mass that you put here in the exponent. 
Um, and additionally, the introduction of that new state ends up leading to new phenomenology because you can also end up having diagrams that look like this, where that um, particle mediates a self-interaction between the dark matter states. Um, so this is just one example out of many, like I said, um, illustrating that you can vary the dark matter model away from this WIMP, still recover the correct dark matter abundance today, um, and you also end up introducing some really neat new signatures that you can um, search for. Pictorial way, the way you can think of this is our old view of the dark matter looks something like this. Our new view, which is oftentimes referred to as sort of dark sectors, is where we introduce, we keep the standard model on its own on the right, and we introduce a completely new sector that has all of the dark physics in it. That could be one or more dark matter particle. There could be new dark force carriers there. So you can have interactions that are occurring just in that dark um, state. The dark matter physics does not necessarily need to communicate with the standard model other than through gravity. Um, or you can add some portal interaction that lets you have another way of interacting with the standard model. Um, Everything that I'm gonna talk about moving forward actually holds in the case where there is no interaction other than through gravity, which um, is the only interaction of dark matter we know definitely has to exist. Um, so moving forward in this context, um, let's start focusing on the case where the dark matter can have these self-interactions. Um, and we're gonna sort of start with the, the simple scenario where the interactions are elastic and then move to the case where you can have inelasticity and kind of compare the results in those two cases. Uh, for concreteness, the model that we're gonna focus on is one that looks like this, where we have just a new mediator that's light that um, uh, mediates this self-interaction. Um, and for the, this, the scenario that we're gonna focus on, the self-scattering is essentially gonna be described by a Yukawa potential in the non-relativistic limit. Uh, this leads to a very particular prediction for these kinds of models. So there's a, a velocity dependence to the scattering interaction. So the probability that two dark matter particles will scatter off of each other. Um, and because the average virial velocity is going to change depending on which astrophysical system you look at, so whether or not you're looking at a dwarf versus a Milky Way system versus a cluster, that means that you can have scenarios where you have self-interactions in one of those systems, but not in another. So the colored lines here are just demonstrating a few arbitrary examples. Um, the blue one would be a scenario where you would observe dark matter self-interacting inside the dwarf galaxy, but you wouldn't see it in a Milky Way or a cluster system. And you could compare that to the green scenario where you would actually observe these self-interactions across all of the systems. So the physics of how self-interacting dark matter works in a halo is actually really beautiful. Um, and I want to walk you through it just because like, it's such, I don't know, it's really beautiful. Um, so it occurs in several stages. So you start in the first stage with core formation. So you can think of this as sort of like a gas of dark matter particles. Now they can interact with each other. And so that means that you can start having heat flow in your halo, which you could not have in the cold dark matter case. The heat will tend to start by flowing to the center of the halo. That's going to turn your halo into an isothermal distribution, um, and it will create a core in the center part of the halo. Um, and so that is a very specific prediction for the result of this initial stage of heat transfer that happens when you add self-interactions to your, to your uh, astrophysical system. Um, and so to kind of come back to our diagram, what that's predicting is this case. So it's saying you're going to have a core. What it looks like as a function of the galaxies that you're looking at is that you form cores all the way up to some of the largest dwarf galaxies. And then beyond that, you end up, your galaxies are so baryon dominated that the presence of the baryons um, actually prevents the core from forming. And so you remain cuspy. So that's why the blue line here for SID, the self-interacting dark matter comes back down to this cuspy region. <clears throat> so the 
you know, for a long time, there has been a discussion of whether or not we see cusps and cores in dwarf galaxies and using this as a direct test for um, self-interacting dark matter. Um, the results of that have been um, really hard to, uh, well, to really kind of come up with a firm conclusion. And the reason is that most of our data lies here, where the predictions for self-interacting dark matter align very closely with the predictions for the case where cold dark matter uh, has, and baryons. So if we had lots of data down here, it would be fantastic. It would be much easier to distinguish the two because in the cold dark matter scenario, you wouldn't expect to get cores, but in the self-interacting dark matter scenario, you do. Um, we're not quite that fortunate yet. Um, and just to kind of show you, like in this region here, if we look at the rotation curve data, so this was work that was done by a couple of undergraduates at Princeton, um, actually right in the middle of the COVID pandemic when they all got stranded uh, in their apartments over the summer. And so they just started looking at this data from um, Spark. And so it's a lot, of, it's a bunch of rotation curve data for dwarf galaxies. Um, and they were fitting them, assuming either cold dark matter or self-interacting dark matter. And the different scenarios are shown in yellow, red, and blue. Um, these are just three examples, but you can kind of see by eye, you can't really distinguish any of the three of them within the uncertainties. Um, and indeed, doing a full Bayesian analysis over 90 of these galaxies, we kind of came to the same conclusion, which is that there was no statistical preference with the current set of data for the self-interacting case over um, any of the cold dark matter models that we were testing. But that's only the first part of the story. The second part of the story, the second stage in this evolution, is that the um, heat flow actually ends up changing directions. So when you reach to this point here, this is not a stable state. Ultimately, the heat flow will reverse and start moving back to the outward regions of that halo. Um, in this process, what ends up happening is you end up forming this very small and highly concentrated core near the center of your galaxy that ends up just becoming extremely dense compared to the rest of the system. Um, this is referred to as core collapse, um, gravi gravithermal core collapse. Um, it's a phenomenon that's well known in the astro community because it occurs in globular clusters. Um, and the same kind of phenomena would translate over to a self-interacting dark matter halo. Um, the key sort of physics reason that this is occurring is that um, the specific heat here is negative. So as you uh, lose, as temperature moves out, you actually end up heating the center of your uh, of the galaxy. Um, another way you could think of it is sort of in the simple picture where in the center, if I have two particles that scatter off of each other, one ends up moving to the center of the galaxy where it's in a deeper gravitational well, so it's going to have a higher temperature. The other one kicks out, but into a heat bath where it hardly ends up affecting the temperature of the outer heat bath. If you continue doing that over and over again, you end up having this sort of runaway process where you heat up the center of the galaxy rapidly and you don't end up changing anything that's happening on the outskirts. Um, so what's fascinating is that actually this has to be occurring if self-interacting dark matter is the model of the universe. Um, so uh, in work by uh, former postdoc Oren Sloan, um, he showed that when you take into account all of the possible constraints on self-interacting dark matter, this is constraints coming from clusters and galaxy groups and the Draco dwarf galaxy, the remaining region of parameter space is one that demands that you have this gravithermal collapse process occurring in the Milky Way's dwarf systems. So this means that we kind of need to completely revisit our expectations for um, the theory and, and understand whether or not it's consistent with the properties of the dwarf galaxies as we observe them. Uh, to kind of illustrate what this would do, um, I've got this cartoon plot of, um, well, it's cartoon plot of actual results that are in a paper that's in preparation. Uh, but what this is showing is sort of the central density of a dwarf galaxy. Um, and so imagine that you can sample this over a bunch of different dwarfs. So you can get a, like a probability distribution for the range of expected values. Um, so if you have cold dark matter, you might end up having a distribution that looks something like the gray. Um, if you have a self-interacting dark matter model that is only in this core collapse phase, 
um, you would tend to have a distribution that look, might look more like the red with central densities that are shifted to lower values because you have cores that are forming. But if you have a self-interacting dark matter model where you have this core collapse process that's occurring, the distribution would look more like the blue. So you'd have some small number of your dwarf galaxies would still be in this core formation phase, but you'd also have this peak here of dwarf galaxies where you'd have gravothermal collapse happening and they would have a really high central density. Um, and then by sort of changing the, you know, the SIDM, the self-interacting dark matter parameters, you kind of shift where the blue and the red distributions are relative to each other. And one of the things that we're trying to understand moving forward is exactly what that sort of the full range of allowed possibility is and testing to see how consistent that is with the diversity of rotation curve data that's being observed in these dwarfs. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really great question. So um, yeah, that's factored in to this. This is a cartoon, but <laughs> it's factored into the cartoon. Um, and it's one of the reasons why you end up seeing some variation when you do have gravothermal collapse, because it's going to, to the time of the gravothermal collapse process is going to depend on the initial concentration of the halo. And so you're going to start off with some spread in concentrations. And then some of those, the most concentrated ones, will end up gravothermally collapsing within the time of the universe. So we would observe those as being really dense. And then the ones that are less concentrated won't. Um, so they'll be in the process of maybe still forming cores and, you know, might gravothermally collapse in the far, far future, but we're not seeing that now. Yeah. Yeah, so this is just to, to show that the data on this is rapidly getting better and, you know, sort of entering a phase where we can do this kind of population statistics. Um, these are dwarf galaxies that have been uh, discovered in Milky Way-like systems in the local universe. Um, I mean, there's like hundreds of these now. Uh, and this is from the Saga survey. There's separate work by Carlston et al. Um, that has a whole other set of these dwarf systems. And so we are kind of entering this era where we can start getting um, population statistics on these dwarfs and we can, you know, hopefully be able to make, you know, probability density distributions like this that we can compare with the data. All right, so the last example before we end um, is gonna be what happens when we add inelasticity into our dark matter model. Um, this actually rather dramatically changes the whole picture because now you allow your dark matter to be able to cool. So we can lose energy um, and cool just the way regular standard model baryons do. Um, that in turn ends up changing quite, um, quite, quite a lot. What ends up happening to the dark matter halo itself? And you can get some really basic intuition of this just by thinking about the virial theorem. So why is a dark matter halo stable? Well, you have some initial um, spherical distribution of dark matter, and it gravitationally collapses until the point of virialization where you have two times the kinetic energies about minus the gravitational potential energy. And that's when the system stabilizes and you have your virialized halo that just sort of hangs around. Now, if you have a theory where the dark matter can continue to lose energy because you've added, allowed it to dissipate, um, that is an additional term to the right-hand side for your virial equation. And that will just mean that the system doesn't virialize and it's just gonna continue collapsing. Um, and so what, even if you start with this initial dark matter halo, it's going to continue collapsing to form some new structure, um, that could be maybe some really dense clump, some compact object, some maybe rotating disc, um, whatever it is, it's very different than a stable puffy dark matter halo. Um, and there's been an open question for some time in terms of exactly what happens in this case, but it's been hard to answer because you really need, um, simulations that capture all of this physics um, to really understand this. So to try to get at this, um, we uh, tackled a sort of toy model that captured some of this physics and would give us an opportunity to start building intuition for what happens when you have this cooling behavior in your dark matter sector. The toy example that we focused on was called atomic dark matter, ADM. Um, it looks just like the standard model, 
for hydrogen. So you introduce a dark electron, a dark proton, and a dark photon. You can form a bound state. That would be your dark hydrogen. And then that dark hydrogen can cool um, in the same manner that regular hydrogen would cool in the standard model. <clears throat> um, and that the degree to which it cools is really important because that ends up setting all of the physics for what occurs in your dark matter halo. So as a reminder, um, just in regular standard model and the regular standard model, um, when we look at the cooling of baryons, um, the cooling rate looks something like this as a function of temperature. Um, and that the behavior there is coming from different processes that contribute to the cooling. So that first peak there comes from collisional excitation of your hydrogen. The second peak comes from collisional excitation of helium. And then you have this sort of broad increase going to higher temperature that's coming from Bremsstrahlung. Um, in our atomic dark matter toy scenario, um, we essentially, if we tune the parameters to be standard model-like, we end up getting a cooling curve that looks very similar, except it misses this peak here because we don't form any helium. Um, our, again, it's just, we only form dark hydrogen. There's no nuclear physics in this really simple model. You can add the nuclear physics. Um, we just haven't done so yet. So in order to simulate this, this took um, uh, a lot of effort. Uh, it was work that was led by my student Sandeep Roy and also Jacob Shen, who is here at Caltech, but uh, is now at, was doing his postdoc at uh, MIT. Um, and so they were working with um, Phil's gizmo code, uh, which is set up to model baryons and cold dark matter. But what Sandeep and Jacob had to do was to extend the code to also end up including this atomic dark matter component and all the um, relevant physics associated with it. So to kind of just summarize that pictorially, what the code includes is uh, cold dark matter particles that can scatter off of each other. Then it includes some gas particles. The gas is treated like a fluid in the simulation and uh, that fluid can cool where the cooling physics there is just set by the cooling parameters for baryons. Um, in regions of very high gas density, you form stars. And then in regions, you know, when the stars get old, they'll explode. And so you'll get some supernova explosion in there. So this is uh, uh, Phil Hopkins's gizmo code in cartoon form as described by a particle physicist. So <laughs> um, then uh, what, uh, what uh, Sandeep and Jacob added was a new piece so that is an additional dark matter component. That new piece uh, is dark matter that acts like a gas. So it's, it's acting like a fluid. Um, it has, it can cool where the cooling physics is now set by updating cooling, updated cooling functions specific to the dark matter sector. Um, and then in regions of very high density, um, because we can't resolve further below that and because we're not actually forming stars, um, we end up labeling those regions as being clumps. So clumps are sort of very highly dense regions of atomic dark matter, where if we could continue resolving below them, they would probably end up forming either dark stars or black holes. And that's kind of an open question that we're going to planning to continue pursuing is what ends up happening if we can sort of push resolution down and understand what happens to those highly dense regions of atomic dark matter. Um, so with all of this physics, contained. Um, we chose a couple different um, uh, atomic dark matter parameter points that sort of varied the, um, uh, the cooling function so we could sample a bit of that space. And what we ultimately ended up simulating was a Milky Way galaxy that was the dark matter was 94% cold dark matter. And we sprinkled in just a tiny little bit, just 6% of this atomic dark matter. That 6% was set by the fact that we knew it would be allowed in terms of cosmological bounds. And we assumed it would be totally safe because, hey, it's 6%. That's a really small number. Um, here is what we found. So the three columns here are going to uh, correspond to three different Milky Ways that we simulated. The first column is one that just had cold dark matter in it. And then these two columns had cold dark matter plus the atomic dark matter, two different parameter points. Um, so these pink. Uh, images here is just what the cold dark matter looks like in all of these sims, kind of follows what we'd expect, looks like a spherical halo, has some substructure to it, nothing out of the ordinary there. 
this is what happens to the atomic dark matter in each of these sims. Um, so what happens, the atomic dark matter collapses because it's cooling. It actually forms a little rotating disk of dark matter near the center of the galaxy in analogy to forming a baryonic disk. Um, and so, and depending on how rapidly the cooling behavior occurs, that's what essentially we're varying between these two columns, the size of the disk changes that you form. You know, and because, you know, this is a dark hydrogen, we can change whatever we want about it, the binding strength, the, uh, you know, the electron, we can do whatever we want. So it's sort of like trying to see what would happen to our galaxy if we had really weirdo hydrogen in there. Um, now, this is actually only a small fraction of that atomic dark matter. Most of it uh, fragments from off of the disk into these clumps. And these clumps end up just uh, accumulating in the center of the galaxy. So 95% of all of the atomic dark matter that's in these simulations just end up clustered in the center of the Milky Way. Um, and that's actually ends up having a huge effect on the, the stellar and gas disks in these systems. So that's what I'm going to show you here on this slide. So this is showing the baryonic gas and the stars in these three different scenarios. Um, and so if you think of this as just being, this is just the regular cold dark matter case, this is how it changes when you add in that atomic dark matter. Um, and in some of these cases, and especially this one, you see that we just completely have broken the galaxy. Um, and what's happening here is you have all of this atomic dark matter that cools and it collapses down to the center. The amount of mass that's there, even though this is only 6% of all of the dark matter that exists in these galaxies, all of it accumulates in the center and its mass is comparable to the mass of the baryons in the center. So the baryons then end up responding and contracting and doing all sorts of you know, crazy things. Um, so one of the big takeaways for me when I saw this was how easy it was to break a galaxy with particle physics. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, this was like our first attempt at really trying to have a more complicated dark matter model in one of our simulations. Um, we specifically chose sets of parameters we thought would be safe by cosmological bounds. And, you know, it's only 6%. What, you know, how is that going to mess anything up? And uh, it messed it up so badly that you can see it by eye. We don't even need to do any fancy fitting. Like, this broke the galaxy. So um, I think this is really interesting moving forward because uh, it, A, underscores that as particle physicists, we really do need to be thinking about what our models are doing to galaxies. <laughs> And B uh, also tells us that galaxies can be really uh, important probes of particle physics. Um, so, you know, in this case, you know, it ruled out these scenarios, but uh, in other scenarios, which we will be continuing to explore, it might actually be the thing that can help us discover them. Um, and I'll just end with showing you one final result that also continues to underscore how much we broke this galaxy. Um, so we have a final paper uh, in preparation, probably coming out next week, led by Caleb, Sandeep, and Jacob, where we actually dug in and look at specifically the dwarf galaxies in these ADM runs. And uh, uh, the dwarf galaxies that we form in these simulations come out to be really dense. So they're shown up here in this plot of circular velocity as a function of radius associated with that circular velocity. Cold dark matter is the blue points and the Milky Way data is sort of in, is in black here. So you can see that um, with these particular parameter space points that we found where we are creating extraordinarily dense dwarf galaxies, too dense in this case. So we know that this isn't consistent, um, but it is interesting because it, it, it is showing us that this is actually giving us a mechanism for creating more dense galaxies. So perhaps other regions of the parameter space might actually be more appropriate and could potentially end up addressing the diversity problem. Um, that's something that's still under active uh, study right now. We're trying to kind of map this out a little bit better. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude by just acknowledging a um, wonderful group of students and postdocs um, at Princeton who have been working on this. I haven't had an opportunity to highlight all of their work, but um, all of the conversations we've had together and their own separate projects have really contributed in uh, many ways uh, in terms of the ideas that I've been sharing with you today. Um, and I'll just leave the conclusion slide up here. Um, I hope I've been able to demonstrate for you that changing dark matter models can really have lead to a very rich phenomenology on galactic and subgalactic scales. 
Um, I showed this to you, two concrete examples with elastic and inelastic self-interactions, but moving forward, our long-term goal is to really kind of understand how this works for a broad class of scenarios um, and, uh, and to really then apply all of this to testing these ideas with the data that's coming from upcoming surveys. So I'll end there and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah, so I didn't show this slide because it's really dense, <laughs> but since you asked, um, yeah, so currently there are no baryonic uh, physics, the, the sort of the baryonic feedback prescriptions that have been implemented in simulation oh, have not way? captured the full What's diversity that? that's been observed in the data. Um, so this is a panel that showing um, up here, this is all data. And then that data is just reflected in the gray points in the other panels. Um, and then the crosses are results from simulations. Um, so on the horizontal axis is a measure of like the baryonic content of these galaxies. And then on the vertical axis um, is a measure of how quarter cuspy they are um, with one being cuspier and this being more chord. Um, and so uh, without going too much into the details of this, what you can see is that in each of these three panels here, the black crosses are not capturing the spread in the gray points. Um, now, there's a variety of ways that one can explain this. One is that there may be um, some observational systematics in the gray points that we're not getting quite right. Um, rotation curve data is really tricky uh, to analyze. So that's you know, point under investigation. And then obviously there's the separate point of, well, maybe we just haven't thought of the right feedback prescription. So this is all sort of still under active, uh, active investigation. Let me just have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. Instead of comparing with particular models, is it possible to do a kind of model independent analysis where you look at the dwarf galaxy counts and then you say, Okay, there has to be self-interaction with strength in a certain regime and or there has to be dissipation with the two one curve. And... That's what we're working towards. Yeah. So I would say like we're kind of in the stage right now of just trying to build intuition for what each of these models does on all of these scales. But where I'm hoping we can get is precisely at the point that you're saying, where we can then um you know, be able to look at the data and because we have this intuition for what different classes of dark matter models would do to it, be like, oh, okay, this is looking like, you know, we have a little bit of this dark matter physics, a little bit of dark matter physics, and then we could sort of reconstruct it out in a more model independent way, right? Like, I don't have any particular affinity for this super random atomic dark matter model that we generated. It was just a really easy place to start, right? But it is giving us a toolbox for then understanding what like cooling does in that dark matter model. So ultimately, we could hopefully do this in a more model independent way where we're not tying ourselves to a particular um, scenario. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Maybe soon. Um, what's your understanding of how far we get down in terms of the, um, the, the dwarf galaxies in terms of the way that the facilitates the model? At what point is it become possible to have this time? Oh, um, you mean um, looking at, yeah. Oh, 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 yep, right here. Um, yeah, so right now we're kind of pushing into this regime here. Um, and um, my understanding is that this is still viable, but it's hard. Um, I mean, I, I'd want to sort of defer to, you know, observers on that. Um, so, but even being able to go out here is already kind of a step in, in a good direction. And that's that's sort of where things are are, are inching right now. So that's, um, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about that. And then also sort of coupling this with the fact that we're just increasing the number of these samples that we're looking at with, you know, data coming in from Saga and some of these other uh, broad surveys. Like, I think that'll allow us to do some of these more population statistic things so that we're not just basing conclusions on one single dwarf galaxy. I think what we're learning is that it's really important to be sampling a whole bunch. Um, I think that's, like, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic 
just given just the quantity of data that's there. There's one last question. Uh, could you go to the slide where you have the elastic scattering models? Mm -hmm. Is it this one? Yeah, the one right up. This one? So, yeah. So yeah. So here, do the different curves correspond to different coupling strengths, or like how are they? Oh yeah. So um, yeah, I glossed over this. Um, but the the scattering cross section for the self interacting models is given here on the right. So there's two free parameters in this. Um, uh, well, so first of all, it depends on velocity v, and then there's two free parameters: the sigma naught and the omega, um, that are determining the shape of this. The sigma naught and the omega depend on the fundamental parameters of the theory. So in this way here, so they each depend on the, they can depend on some combination of the dark matter mass, the mediator mass, and the coupling. Yeah. So can we place any bounds on these parameters? Because standard one part was E, we just do experiments and measure cross sections and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, well, the way that we've, we've uh, summarized those bounds, oops, here, is in terms, specifically in terms of this velocity scale and the cross section, so in terms of the sigma naught and the omega, um, so that's what this plane here is looking at. And the shaded out regions are the regions that are excluded by, by data. And then, um, I mean, I guess you could then do a more fine backing out of that in terms of what it means in terms of the individual masses. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Maybe that's a good place to stop. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. And let's thank uh, Maria and Joanna.